Hello, my name is Dylan Casey Marshall, and I'm delighted to be joined on the podcast today by Pat Cox, former president of the European Parliament, to discuss the forthcoming European Parliament elections, which will take place in Ireland on the 7th of June. This podcast is part of the Institute of International European Affairs' Future Proof in Europe project, which is kindly supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. I would like to welcome you to the podcast, Pat, and thank you for being so generous with your time. Diving straight into the questions, 450 million European citizens will be going to the polls in the first week of June to elect 720 members of the European Parliament. In your view, what's at stake in this election for European democracy? I think that these uh, European Parliament elections, and indeed I might add the forthcoming US presidential elections, uh, are ones that are perhaps the most consequential of recent decades. I say that in respect of the European Union because of the uh, probable rise of the right in terms of the support and votes that they're likely to get with their focus on nationalism, identity politics, populism, culture wars, and so on. The right has grown slowly but surely in Europe over the past three decades. And I think it would be fair to say that where once the right was ostracized, they are now increasingly normalized. I was looking at a, a study published earlier this year by the European Council on Foreign Relations, and they predicted doing a poll of polls, uh, what they called a sharp turn to the right in the upcoming European Parliament elections. They suggested that right wing parties are likely to top the poll in eight member states and possibly to be second in a further nine. Collectively, according to that uh, prediction, uh, they were suggesting that right-wing MEPs could constitute up to one in four of future MEPs after this election. Although, <laughs> to maintain a sense of perspective, that means three in four Euro deputies in the next parliament would not be from the far right in such a scenario. So I think uh, that is really the, the, the context and the expectation. In terms of the groups, the European People's Party is likely to uh, hold its number of deputies or increase uh, marginally. Uh, the Alliance of Socialists and Democrats uh, is likely to lose some seats, uh, but more marginal than substantial. The Renew group, and the Greens and uh, EFA are likely to be the two groups with the heaviest potential losses. And the, the biggest winners will be the ID group, the Identity and Democracy group of the far right and the ECR, uh, the European Conservative and Reform Group. Uh, both of those are likely to see gains. And the new dynamics in the next parliament will be a more complex chemistry of consent and dissent requiring a careful coalition building uh, on a variable mix of issues uh, over the coming mandate of five years. Thank you for that. And just following up on that point on the rise of the right, the nationalistic and far right and their history of Russophilia and links with the ruling party of Russia, do you think this election will have an impact on the EU's commitment to Ukraine? Overall, if you ask me, as you're doing, I would suggest uh, no or very little. And let me try to explain that. For countries like Poland and the three Baltic states, ultimately a stable, secure, peaceful Ukraine is a geopolitical and a security priority. In terms of the states that joined 20 years ago, Hungary has been uh, the spoiler, if you want, as regards uh, cooperation with Ukraine from day one. When the government changed in Slovakia uh, to be led by uh, Robert Fico, whom I hope is able to make a full recovery after the shocking assassination attempt of last week, he changed Slovakia's stance on the delivery of arms to Ukraine and the delivery of uh, MiG fighters to Ukraine. But other than that, he has not so far 
exhibited himself or Slovakia to be blockers, for example, on granting candidate status to Ukraine. Also, an important straw in the wind, one might call it, the new Dutch government, um, which is a, an amalgam of four parties, whose largest party is uh, Geert Wilders' um, uh, populist uh, far-right party, they have agreed a coalition deal which insists on continuing support for Ukraine, even as Wilders and his party actually argued against it and won votes on that basis. Uh, so that confirms, if you want, still a strong signal regarding support for Ukraine. And if we look to the elections uh, held in Italy some time back, where uh, Giorgia Maloney's Fratelli d'Italia party um, made uh, very big uh, gains, uh, contrary to what some expectations had been, she stuck solidly with the European position on Ukraine, something which I think has helped to forge a potentially close relationship uh, working-wise between her and the outgoing and possible incoming president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. So although you know different things may be more contested, I think for geopolitical and security reasons, the European Union, even with more right-wing deputies, is more likely than not to hold its current course regarding Ukraine. Uh, now turning to the elections and, the, and policy and politics, what have you observed as the main policy areas that this election is being fought over? Well, let me make several points. As someone who contested several European elections, albeit some considerable time ago, one of the things that European elections have always done is that they have struggled to deal with European issues. Uh, people get elected from the bottom up, and from the bottom up, when you look at uh, what is uh, motivating voters state by state, constituency by constituency, those issues are not always necessarily what I'd call the top-down European priorities. However, I think there are two issues which are turning up in most states at this stage connected to the European Parliament elections. Uh, they are respectively immigration and uh, the Green Deal. I think on immigration, it's clear to us that that has become an increasingly sensitive political issue over recent years especially with the rise of the right, but also because of attempts by parties in the centre to try to reclaim lost ground by adopting some of the policy perspectives that in the past would have been more exclusively belonging to populists or the far right. As you know, the EU agreed uh, recently, uh, after many years of attempting it, a new asylum and immigration pact and its catchphrase, one also being used here in Ireland by the Taoiseach, is that the policy will be firm but fair, seeking to burden share between member states and to enhance border control in the EU, while at the same time uh, respecting EU values. Now, I think having tougher border controls and uh, how to deal with uh, asylum processing and respecting EU values may be tough uh, to find reconciliation on. But what is clear to me is that the EU progressively is beginning to align its asylum regime with migration management objectives through externalization, through placing readmission and return at the heart of EU migration policy, and even now to linking targeted external funding, funding to the fulfillment of migration management objectives. So, you know, this is potentially quite a sea change in EU perspective and policy. What its dynamics will be, how successful it will be at actually slowing down, limiting or reversing the flow of migrants, of course, only time will tend. But I think this is one of the most contested and sensitive political areas across the EU today. I think the second one, 
is an evident, um, not exclusively populist and right, uh, but particularly populist and right wing pushback against the EU's Green Deal. Um, certainly with a whole range of new regulations and uh, ambitious transition periods, uh, it's relatively easy picking to engage in the game of externalizing blame that the problem is Brussels and these rules. Uh, whereas in fact, of course, the underlying problem is global warming. And whatever about electoral cycles and short term political preferences, the underlying realities to do with greenhouse gas emissions and their impact on extreme weather events are clear and well known to us. And every week at this stage in Europe um, and of course beyond Europe, we see clear examples of shockingly costly extreme weather events to do with nature, to do with human beings, uh, to do with wrecked infrastructure and so on. And the truth is physics doesn't change, even if politics does. So I think this is going to be really quite the challenge because if we were to not just push back temporarily, but actually roll back on uh, the green transition, I think we'd simply store up more problems to do with costly extreme weather events than those we already have. But I think those two issues, immigration and uh, pushback on the Green Deal are probably the two clearest pan-European Union issues to emerge across the different member states and the multiplicity of Euro constituencies. Uh, picking up on that point uh, that you raised on the external relations in migration management, how do you think the geopolitical context is shaping uh, this election? I think probably this is the most complex geopolitical situation globally that the EU and the West in general uh, has uh, faced in many decades. We've got the war in Ukraine. But in addition, we've got, of course, the inexorable rise of China since it joined the WTO uh, in the early years of uh, this uh, century. We've got the Sino-Russian no-limits friendship and all that that can mean for Russia's capacity to fight the war in Ukraine. We've got a direct supply of arms and armaments to Russia from Iran and North Korea. We've got all of the tensions and potential wider instability of the shocking war that's being prosecuted in the Middle East and in, uh, in Gaza. We've got the possibility of a second Trump presidency. And this contemporary geopolitical reality, which is enormously complicated, should not be ignored. I mean, my own feeling is that collectively in the West and collectively for the EU, we've entered a new age of deep uncertainty. And, you know, this is occurring at a time of spreading nuclear proliferation with diminished and contested strategic weapon safeguards. We know that the world we live in shares very deep interdependence, but we know it also shares deep vulnerability. Climate doesn't uh, respect borders. Uh, pandemics don't respect borders. And unhappily, Russia's war of aggression suggests uh, that there is a, a return to neo-imperial politics and power political rivalry that may not respect borders. As regards other issues in this mix, uh, if we look at international trade, I think there was a kind of a bet in the early noughties that China joining the WTO would democratize China, and that hasn't paid off. In fact, the ground has shifted from an economic embrace of China to great power geopolitical tension and rivalry, especially between the United States and China, which of course makes it very difficult for EU positioning in this space. 
uh, we we rely through NATO on strategic defense that is transatlantic. Uh, we rely on the norms and values of a post-war institutional order where the USA has been an anchor tenant. And that could change, of course, with a new US administration. So I think for EU to put this into other areas outside security and defense, I think that we are living in a multipolar world, but it's with contested multilateralism. Uh, we now have a multi-order world with different weighty players uh, like China, the global south and so on, pressing for different agendas and for different institutions. So I think all of this will weigh on uh, EU policy evolution in the coming five years. And I suppose an important point to make as a, as a European, as an Irish European, is the global South matters a lot and we need to do better in developing our complex relations with them. The global South is non-West, but all the global South is not anti-West. And I think we need to take that into account as we develop this kind of complex tapestry of uh, bilateral and multilateral EU relations in trade, security and other domains in the coming years. Thank you for that. And now looking ahead a little bit, what can we, in your opinion, expect to see after the elections? We will see EU leaders and the new European Parliament deciding on the EU's Euro leadership roles. How could a large right-wing po populist bloc in both the European Council, you mentioned the rapprochement between Giorgio Maloney, the Prime Minister of Italy, and outgoing President Ursula von der Leyen, and a right-wing populist bloc in the European Parliament, how could these influence the decisions on who becomes leaders of the EU institutions? That, that, that's an interesting question. I'll, I'll give you my best guess at this. The first thing to say about the European Parliament is that it operates through de facto coalitions, even if no formal coalition agreements exist. And this is essential since every group in the European Parliament is and always has been a minority. No single group ever got elected with a majority vote. Uh, what changed back in 2019 and now remains the case and will remain the case is that the two largest groups, which between them were a majority, have no longer been a majority since 2019. They're being squeezed by the fragmentation of national and European politics and their numbers are diminished, not dramatically, but sufficiently to put them collectively into a minority status. I think that the, the next uh, parliament is likely to see a leading role, at least after the election, for the EPP group, uh, who will nominate Ursula von der Leyen to be the new commission president. The parliament will elect its own president, typically, but not necessarily, those presidents have rotated slightly Tweedledum, Tweedledee between the two largest groups on the basis of what you might call constitutive coalitions over time. There have been a few exceptions, but they are pretty exceptional. My own privilege to lead the parliament is one of those few exceptions. Uh, I think Ursula von der Leyen will need to come with a program that tries to optimize her support from the traditionally pro-European groups, her own, the Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, the Renew Group and the Greens, even if diminished. I think together all of those will be smaller than before, but will come in somewhere perhaps around 60% of MEPs. That doesn't get you over the line on every issue, on every vote, uh, but I do think that those who share a broad European conviction will want to optimize their influence and to seek to minimize the influence of a, a new and more uh, invigorated right. I think there's a second issue 
not to be confused, uh, the Wilders, the Gerd Wilders uh, government in Netherlands is an example, that winning votes and winning power in politics, uh, particularly if there are multi-party coalitions, are not the same thing. In terms of coherence, I think the political forces to the right of the European People's Party are a bit of a mixed bag. And so the question is, what will be their capacity to coherently coalesce on issues with each other in order to maximize their own influence? I don't make any dramatic prediction, politics being what it is, people can be very pragmatic, but let me give you two examples to illustrate my point. Poland's Law and Justice Party is, and was at the outset, a key member of the ECR group. That's the group also now expecting a big uh, group of Fratelli d'Italia MEPs uh, under the leadership of Giorgia Meloni, the current Prime Minister of Italy. Law and Justice is strongly Atlanticist, it's pro-NATO, it's Russophobic, it's pro-Ukraine. Mr. Orban and his Fidesz party left the EPP, were sitting in no group in the last mandate, but are talking about possibly joining the ECR group. That would be the group with Law and Justice Party, among others. Fidesz is pro-Trump, hostile to supporting Ukraine, were the last NATO state to support Sweden's NATO membership and generally have been acting as spoilers inside the Western Alliance and of builders of coalitions uh, with Beijing and to a lesser but still visible degree with Moscow. So how you would reconcile the law and justice position with the Fides position and presume to get a coherent logic on all of those sensitive foreign policy issues escapes me at the moment. And so uh, I wonder if in the end, the numbers will be as powerful as they might be, given the diversity and incoherence of the collectivity, which would constitute the new right in the next European Parliament. Yes, that fragmentation of the members of the right uh, to the EPP has always been an issue amongst those groups and their coherence and ability to work together. So Precisely. Yeah. we're just coming up on time here. So just one as one final last question, looking back at your time as president of the European Parliament, what was your most memorable achievement or challenge? And maybe what could policymakers, European policymakers learn from that today? Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm low to talk about my own achievements because these are things of the period of time and the collective and so on. But no doubt the biggest challenge uh, and where the parliament played a role in achieving uh, a positive outcome was the big bang enlargement of 2024. And in respect of uh, my, my own work on that, uh, but I don't put this down in some egotistic way, as my own personal achievement, I, in addition to having to travel from Ireland to Brussels and Strasbourg to go to work, I made 203 additional visits beyond Brussels and Strasbourg involving 430 additional commercial flights, mostly each week going east at the start and or at the end of the week I visited 33 states during that presidency. That included all the accession states of 2004 and all of the candidate states of today, with the exception of uh, Georgia and Ukraine 20 years ago during my mandate. I had the privilege to address 24 clean recessions in national parliaments, including in all of the accession state parliaments. Uh, we devised in the Parliament, myself and the uh, Secretary General, Julian Priestley, a strategic, political and administrative plan that invited uh, observer MEPs to join us in the European Parliament, first before a critically important summit in Copenhagen 
in 2022, which decided the budget on enlargement and subsequently uh, after they signed accession treaties in April of 2003 in Athens, where we brought them to what I call pre-socialize them, to pre-introduce them, to embrace them as colleagues before the enlargement. For them, it opened up to us and for us, it, it, it forced us to develop our software capacity across all the new languages and to develop our interpretation capacity ahead of the other institutions. The two big standout days for me to do with the moment of definition was the 1st of May in the Phoenix Park, um, where Seamus Heaney was invited to celebrate the moment. He composed a poem called Beacons at Bialtana. And in it, um, and it's, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, poem that captured the moment, he talked in an optimistic way about moving lips, moving minds, and making new meanings flare. Then a few days later, on a Monday in Strasbourg, we had an event with the 10 speakers of the new parliaments. We raised their national flags. I was joined at that by the man who personified Solidarność in Gdansk uh, at its foundation, Lech Walesa, and I had negotiated with the Polish government to have them make a gift to the parliament of the 10 massive flagpoles to receive the new member state flags made in the shipyard in Gdansk and symbolically traveling, traveling that journey from Gdansk and what it represented at the time of communism to Strasbourg and what it represented as a new moment in European history. And for me, that enlargement, as I've looked back on it now uh, at many speaking engagements in recent weeks, has brought spectacular growth and success to the countries that joined. Their GDP was less than half of the EU average back then. It's now more than three quarters of that average. Their health has improved, their education standards have improved, quality of life and living standards clearly improved. Their agricultural output has doubled in the region. And I think overall it has been win-win. Of course, there have been issues of backsliding on values, uh, which I regret. But I remain from that an enlargement optimist, but not a naive one. So if you ask me for a lesson for the future, I'd say when history knocks on the door and enlargement beckons, we should be optimistic about it. The first enlargement and our 51 years in EEC and EU has transformed our country. Uh, the enlargements involving Greece, Portugal and Spain underwrote and sustained their post-fascist democracies. The Big Bang enlargement has been a really big success. I think, in fact, enlargement has been one of the most powerfully positive and transformative policies in the European Union. But the next time round, if we're learning the lessons of some backsliding on share values, I think we need to put in some new protective capacity to ensure that backsliding carries a cost and that we can develop some red cards to add to the yellow cards of uh, monetary or uh, grant giving conditionality that have been used in the more recent past. So those would be my lessons, uh, not naive on enlargement, but very supportive of it. Uh, the need to develop some new policy instruments associated with it, and an understanding that as before, enlargement is a challenge for both sides, a huge transitional and transformative challenge for those who wish to join, but also a huge challenge for the EU to absorb new member states in terms of decision-making procedures, institutional capacity, and of course, critically important, Europe's budgetary capacity to cope with that as well. That's a very interesting reflection. Thank you. No, all that's my, left. My pleasure, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you. No, all that's left for me to do is thank you, Pat, for giving us your time and very valuable insights. Mm -hmm.